Support Wrestle Talk. Support each other. Thank you to Twitter user MangaGirl232 for that intro taken from last night's Quizzlemania, where I came last yet again, meaning I had to wax my very hairy chest in punishment. The streak doesn't just live in my loss record, but also from my bloody tears crying from my now hairless nipples. And even with all that pain and punishment, all everyone's talking about is David Starr's mum. But the real story here is that because of all of your incredible support, we raised almost $7,000 for the mental health charity Calm, the campaign against living miserably. From all of us here at WrestleTalk and our Quizzlemania guests, thank you so, so much for helping support each other. Now, news! After last night's episode of NXT Saw, Drake Maverick, Maverickception worked. When his job back with WWE, he might not be the only wrestler fired in April re-signing with the company. According to Brian Alvarez on Wrestling Observer Live yesterday, several wrestlers who were part of WWE's mass releases have been offered deals to come back. However, their pay will be significantly reduced, with Alvarez calling it a fraction of what they were making. Interestingly, Impact Wrestling teased on this week's episode that practically all of those let go would soon be heading to the Impact Zone with their first and last names switched around. Running a promo showing TNA clips of Anderson and Gallows, Micah Maria Kanellis, Eric Young, EC3, Kurt Hawkins, a Bulgarian flag for Rusev in lieu of any actual footage, and... Drake Maverick. He's gone from having no jobs to all the jobs. While Maverick staying with NXT rules him out of a Slammiversary appearance next month, Ryan Alvarez points out that the lower money offers from WWE means the majority will choose Impact. The offers that I've seen, we may be seeing a fair number of people showing up in Impact. I don't know that, but I just know that based on what I've seen, some renewal offers, there are definitely people that would definitely go to Impact Wrestling. Who would you like to see turn up in Impact? Impact. Let me know in the comments because I'll be replying to people from out of my bloody and blotchy chest. Speaking of Impact, that's where Jeff Hardy reinvigorated his career after leaving WWE in 2009 amid substance abuse controversy. To then have even more substance abuse controversy. That segue got real dark real fast. And it's an issue that CM Punk has publicly now criticised WWE for exploiting. Last Friday's Smackdown opened on a very controversial angle, where Hardy was framed for an intoxicated hit and run on Elias. Jeff was arrested, but later cleared and seemingly dropped back off at Smackdown once they realised he wasn't drunk. Which still, in kayfabe, doesn't excuse running over a guy, as Hardy was still their main suspect, drunk or not. Hardy was arrested twice last year for substance related incidents, the latter of which was a DWI only in October. It's a storyline that's meant to be exploitative, which has made many viewers feel uncomfortable. Jeff's own brother Matt seemingly disapproved of the angle tweeting as it happened on SmackDown. Just to reiterate, I'm happy to be working at AEW for Tony Khan on Wednesdays. And now Jeff's once rival CM Punk, who actually used Hardy's substance abuse issues as heel promo material throughout their 2009 feud in WWE, has said said on WWE backstage, My thing with this segment and this story is that I believe somebody's sobriety is very fragile and very important. I think cleaning your life up and being sober is something to be proud of. We can champion that in different ways. I think this is the wrong way to go about it. You just don't put him in front of that moving car. But this isn't the only controversy WWE has experienced over the last week. Forgotten Sons leader Jackson Riker posted a tweet supporting Donald Trump following the US president's address earlier this week, which drew significant heat from several WWE wrestlers, with Kevin Owens, Ricochet, Batista, and even his own stablemate Steve Cutler and Wesley Blake calling him out on Twitter. Then, the following day, a Facebook post Riker made in 2019 resurfaced, criticizing the Black Lives Matter movement. Another post has now been found from 2017, where Riker posted a picture of himself with a very dark tan for a bodybuilding competition and called himself 
Soul Man. Because of this, Riker has now made all his social media accounts private. Now it's time for a review of last night's AEW Dynamite in about five minutes. After a sensitively dumb Black Lives Matter graphic, Dynamite opened on Kenny Omega and Hangman Page. I've missed you so much, Hangman Page! Defending their tag team titles against Jimmy Havoc and Kip Sabian. With not just the freshly debuted FTR watching on from the stands, Far away the revival, but also Britt Baker in a pimp my wheelchair. With the referee distracted, ejecting Penelope Ford, Havoc worked over Paige with a wrench, which Paige didn't even sell that much, for the match to level up into back and forth craziness for the final third, and Paige and Omega ultimately retaining. This was a fantastic opener, not just seeing a welcome return of the tag team titles to TV, but also elevating Havoc and Sabian, although their momentum will likely be lost in the shuffle of an increasingly stacked, cheers for that Pete, tag division. The internet criticism to Sean Spears' poorly received comedy match at Double or Nothing took physical form next as Tully Blanchard screamed at him backstage before revealing what Sean has been missing in a lockbox. But not that lockbox to turn his act around. A black glove. Sean Spears joining Seth Rollins confirmed? Who can stop the path of Cage? Unsurprisingly not random enhancement talent, with Cage squashing Sean D. Taz cut a badass promo afterwards, which Mox answered promising Cage will be fighting a new kind of shark. Shark Boy return confirmed! But as Woody Allen will remind you, wrestling storylines are like sharks. They gotta keep moving forward. Nailed that Woody Allen impression. Which is what Lance Archer is trying to do following his double or nothing loss. The show cut to Archer murdering some random guy outside after also seemingly knocking down all the buildings in the immediate vicinity, where he told an even more nervous than usual Alex Marvez he's on a new mission. It was nice to see Lance do the talking over Jake, adding a new dimension to their act. Oh, this is very itchy on my chest. V1 Matt Hardy then hung out with Private Party in a bar to form The Hardy Party, a fantastic grouping to get over the younger team, and then Matt bowed and said respect for Sammy Guevara while passing him in the hall. It really feels like a lot of subtle teases are being dropped over recent weeks for Sammy's eventual babyface turn. But hopefully that isn't planned for any time soon, because move aside murder hawk Lance Archer, Sammy murdering Chris Jericho's Judas entrance music music is one of the best recurring bits on AEW. Thanks for your support on Patreon and your incredible donation on last night's Quizzle Mania, the Kessel Run DX Solo. Chris Jericho took on Colt Cabana after blaming him for letting Mike Tyson get away last week, but despite Cabana's amazingly athletic offense, everyone falls to the Judas elbow, it's Judas effective. In what was interestingly only Jericho's third singles match of the year so far. Jericho then called out the baddest man on the planet, but be careful what you wish for, because someone far more terrifying and relaxed emerged from the entrance. Orange Cassidy. Cassidy ran wild with his hands in his pockets, seemingly setting up an Inner Circle vs Best Friends program after the heels jumped him last week. Britt Baker then had a brilliant training montage not really doing much on her wheelchair, complete with bonus Tony Schiavone, which led into her giving the following Big Swole vs Nyla Rose match evils from her giant podium-like chair from the crowd. Women's champion Sheeda was also watching on from ringside to see Swole get a few near falls, but Rose eventually wins with a spinebuster powerbomb. Swole got a bit of heat back, chasing off Robo Baker as her wheelchair became part of a larger moving platform, but while it's nice to see the women's division telling multiple stories again, this still isn't an effective build on Double or Nothing's momentum, not doing much at all for the women's title or the victorious Chris Statlander. Tony Schiavone interviewed Darby Allen, who continued building his storyline with Taz and Cage, even though Taz and Cage are feuding with Moxley. I'm seeing double here. Four feuds for one single act. And then Shivani had an excellent sit-down interview with FTR, where they put over all the amazing tag teams in AEW, like how the Lucha Bros style is so different to theirs, because Dax and Cash actually tag in and out, but conspicuously left out the Young Bucks, saying they don't want to have a match with them, they want to punch them 
in the face. Feisty the revival. Hopefully AEW keep them apart for a while and have FTR run through a few other tag teams to rebuild Dax and Cash after a terrible final year in WWE. The first of which appears to be against The Butcher and The Blade, who interrupted the interview to set up FTR's debut match next week. First time in the ring, FTR. Following his loss to Jericho and to Archer in the TNT title tournament, Brody Lee then approached Cabana backstage about joining Dark Order, which Colt didn't fully rule out. If this happens, please rechristen him as Scotty Goldman. And the main event saw the first installment of Cody doing everything he can to get over new talent, and yes, you better believe that involves blading his own forehead. Cody and Jungle Boy had a great TV match, with Cody aggressively going against one of the purest white meat, blue-eyed baby faces in recent times. The finish came after a big top rope fall through a table spot, which was followed by Cody winning with a crossroads and the Nightmare family wholesomely celebrating with Jurassic Express for really nice feels to close the show. And right now, some good feels is what we all need. While nowhere near as newsworthy as last week's 5 out of 5 show, this was a really solid episode. Like Raw, there were a lot of recaps on this pre-taped show, but unlike Monday Night, nothing ever dragged here. And that's definitely because Tony Khan pays me all that money, not because AEW has a far more organic, naturalistic presentation. This week's Dynamite is a high middle of the roads. Watch last night's Quizzlemania 10, including me getting my chest waxed and Sean Ross Sapp hitting on David Starr's mum by clicking the video on the right. And someone backstage in WWE has called for Nia Jax to be fired. Find out the full story by clicking the video below that. Make WrestleTalk.com your homepage for all the latest wrestling news. I've been Ollie Davis, and that was wrestling.